I want to add my congratulations to our four seniors, the four young men who graduated high school. Our prayers go with you as you move on into uh, school further or work or whatever it may be that your plans are. Also, I don't know if we mentioned it, but uh, the, the signs with uh, your picture on it are yours, so you can take them. Um, I think they're sitting on the outside of the auditorium there. Also want to recognize one of our young ladies uh, that was baptized this week at church camp, Eleanor. Is she here this morning? She is. Eleanor Worsell was baptized this week at church camp. We rejoice. We rejoice in that with her and her family. How many of you have pet fish? Anybody have pet fish? Uh, a fish tank at home? Anybody? What if one day your fish said to you, and let's, let's skip uh, for a second addressing why or how you're talking to your fish, but what if one day your fish said to you, why don't you come down in here and visit me in the tank? Visit where I live for a while. And your response is, I can't do that. I just can't breathe underwater, right? I mean, you can talk with fish, but you can't be expected to, to breathe underwater. Let's not get silly. Would that be a mean thing to say to the fish? Uh, would that be a, a, a cruel answer? I can't survive in your environment, little fishy. I cannot breathe there with you. Well, that wouldn't be mean or, or cruel. That would just be the truth, wouldn't it? It's simply an honest statement about your nature, about your makeup, right? Now, we know that the Bible says that God cannot abide sin. He cannot put up with it. He can't wink at it. He can't be around it or be okay with it in any way. We, on the other hand, live and breathe in a sin environment, correct? All have sinned, Scripture says, and have fallen short of God's glory. And that's not okay with God. His nature does not allow him to live in that morass of sin. He is holy, perfectly so. So it's not cruel or mean for him to tell the truth about it. But frankly, there's a lot of people who think it is. A lot of people think it, it's unreasonable for God to say that they're not okay just because they sin. After all, they're not that bad. They, they know that others are worse than them. And they do a lot of good things. They do good deeds. They, they vote for the right people. They support the correct causes. They share in all the high-minded opinions of the earth. God must be okay with them because everyone else is. Even, I think, some religious people think that their good works entitles them to life in the presence of God. That they can somehow work their way into the good graces of God. But God has not changed. The facts have not changed. God doesn't live in our sin environment. But there is a way that this dilemma can be solved, can be fixed. There's even a way, if you think about it, that you can breathe underwater, right? If you have the right equipment, if you have the right setup, scuba gear, whatever, you can go down there and, and you can talk to your pet fishy. And then the guys in white coats can come and take you off to a happier place. And there's a way, much more importantly, 
that we can live with God and God can live with us. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God made a way. He said, if you get into Christ, then we can live together. We can be together. It's, it's the way of the cross. That's our lifeline. That's our oxygen tank, if you will. That's our spiritual scuba gear. It's the way that God made possible for us to live in his environment. But it took the work of Jesus. It took his death, as we've already remembered this morning. But it also took his life. He died for us, yes. But he also lived for us. And he lives still for us. Heard a, heard a story one time about a young couple. They had been uh, dating seriously for some time. And, and one time, uh, one, one particular day, the young man was just sort of declaring his undying love for the young lady. And he said to her, sweetheart, I love you so much, I would die for you. And she appreciated his words, of course. But she very wisely, I think ask, yes, but would you live for me? You see, that's what would make for a great relationship and a great marriage eventually. Would he live for her? Well, Jesus lived for you. I want to make sure we understand that this morning. Yes, he died for you. That's the gospel we preach, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. But Jesus lived for you also. And folks, if he had not lived for us, his death for us would have been meaningless. And I'm not just trying to toy with words in this. This has great meaning for the way we live our lives. You see, when we come to Christ, we come to Christ in, in the way the Bible says we should, we actually go through a, a death experience. We die with Christ. We die to our old way of life. That's what the Bible calls repentance. We're buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. We are raised with Christ to a new life. And so, you see, it's possible, it's possible that a person could do all that. In effect, they could say to Jesus, I'll die for you. But after that, you know what the question is, don't you? It comes from the Lord. Yes, but will you live for me? So let's look at the scripture for a moment this morning, I want us to jump um, into the midst of some deep waters in Scripture for a couple of minutes. Romans chapter 5. Maybe no deeper waters in all, all the Bible than Romans chapter 5. So I'm not going to pretend that we're digging out all the truth or plumbing all the depths of this text, but I do want us to see this important idea from the Bible today, and then I want us to apply it as best we can to our life. We're going to read in a moment the last four verses of Romans 5. That's verses 18 through 21. Really, some of the most important things ever said in God's Word are right here in this fifth chapter of Romans. And I think these verses at the end of chapter 5, they don't only close chapter 5, but also the entire first section of this great letter to the Romans, which deals with the fact that all mankind has sinned and they've all fallen short of the glory of God, fallen short of favor with God. 
but that God has done something about this in his son, Jesus Christ. And he's made a way for this broken relationship to be repaired, to be reconciled. That's a quick summary of the first five chapters of, of the book of Romans. In chapter 5 in particular, Paul's discussed how we can have peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ when we respond to him, when we respond with a faith response, when we demonstrate obedient faith in Christ, God showers us with his amazing grace as a gift. And then in the second half of this chapter, Paul sets out to illustrate this by making a comparison. He compares Jesus, the greatest man who ever lived, with Adam, the first man who ever lived. And he does this in, in several ways. It's an interesting study, but it's beyond our time this morning. But, but suffice it to say that when you compare these two, Jesus and Adam, Jesus is always superior. You know, Adam was a sinner, like we all are. Jesus was not. Adam actually started the whole sin problem of the human race, and Jesus offered a fix to it, which only he could offer, you see. Well, he, he wraps all this up in verses 18 through 21. Let's just hear those words uh, for a moment this morning. Paul writes, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but when sin increased grace, abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I hope you notice there the message that we've been trying to get at this morning, which is Jesus lived for us. Yes, he died for us, but he also lived for us. And that makes all the difference in everything. The name Adam is not mentioned there in the verses that we read. But if you, if you read the previous verses leading up to it, you'll see that's who Paul's referring to in verse 18 when he writes this phrase, One trespass led to condemnation for all men. See, for Paul, there's a sense in which Adam is a representative of the entire human race. And that includes us, of course. Uh, he's just like all of us. He sinned. And, and sin is that thing that separates us from God. Remember, God cannot abide it. He cannot live in, in that environment. And, and so sin separates us from God, just like it did Adam and Eve with their first sin. But notice what Paul goes on to say, because he's not just telling bad news. Um, he has good news to share. Verse 18, once again, as one tre trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What's this a reference to? This act of righteousness that he talks about. It's the cross of Christ. Now that is what fixes the sin problem of, of mankind. The death of Jesus on the cross. One act of righteousness by Jesus Christ the righteous. And then, just in case we didn't hear him clearly enough the first time, Paul says it slightly differently in verse 19, because he says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, again, what's that a reference to? That's Adam. 
the first human being who, like all subsequent human beings, sinned and thus brought the disapproval of God upon them because of their sin. Why is God, why is God upset with we humans? Because we're disobedient. He made us. He gave us life. We shake our fist in his face and say, don't want to do it like you want me to do it. We are disobedient. We're sinners. All of us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So that's all true. But that is not all the truth. Look at the rest of the verse in verse 19. So, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, what man is he talking about, do you think? It's Jesus. By one man's obedience, one man who perfectly and fully and completely obeyed God. Only one man ever did, Jesus the Christ. By one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. You see, Jesus not only died for you, he lived for you. He lived a life of perfect obedience. Scripture says, in Hebrews 5 and verse 8, though he, were a son, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Then in another passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Jesus was found in human form and humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus lived a life of obedience perfectly that is why he was uniquely qualified to die an atoning death for me and for you sinners though we are he was the perfect sacrifice before God for sins because of the perfect way he lived and he lived that perfect life for you Jesus lived for you just like he died for you. My question this morning for us is this. Will we live for him? He lived for you. Will you live for him? I want you to remember what one of his closest followers said one time, Peter. You remember in the moments leading up to his arrest? Peter said, I'll die for you, Lord. But would he live for him? You know, when the pressure was on Peter, when he was in the darkness there in the courtyard of the high priest and everybody's looking at him and somebody's pointing the finger and saying, you were with him, you're one of his, aren't you? You belong to this condemned man. Would Peter live for Jesus then? Well, you know the answer because you know the story. Ever been there yourself? All the pressure's on you. Somebody's pointing at you. Are you one of those Jesus people? In those moments, will we live for him? He died for you. Will you live for him? That's the question I leave you with this morning. And before we go, if you need to come before 
this body and ask for prayers or encouragement or, or you need to come and to the Lord and say, I'm giving myself to you today. Say yes to Jesus and obey his gospel. We invite you to come and take care of that while we stand, while we sing.